Are you happy in your life? That's a big question. Isn't it just? Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowlane. Each episode of The Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 95. It is our first episode of the new year and we are back to Erica's choice. What are we talking about today? For this first episode of the new year, I wanted to kick things off in a really positive way. You know, completely change direction from my morose nature, films about suicide, you know, that usual New Year's fair. So I chose Happy Go Lucky from 2008, directed by Mike Lee, with Sally Hawkins, Alexis Siegerman, Eddie Marson, and Samuel Rukin. We get to know Poppy a cheery, colorful North London school teacher whose optimism tends to exasperate those around her. And we explore her relationships. When I look at all the films that came before this, I really think of Mike Lee as an actor's director versus a technician. I think he would say the same. What about you? I think that's completely accurate. He started as a theater director and playwright in the mid-1960s. And it was actually one of your favorites, John Cassavetes, that made him think, I can make a complete play from scratch with a group of actors. Emphasis on with this group of actors. Yeah, his films were never full of virtuosic flourishes, I wouldn't say. It's a lot of people sitting in rooms. Instead, because of that collaborative process that you just referred to, he has always been more interested in getting to the emotional core of the story working closely with his cast to develop that story through months of rehearsal and improvisation, almost all of which happens before the cameras roll. And I didn't realize that. I think I had it exactly backwards from that. I assumed that in front of the camera, they were improvising like crazy and building as they go. No, what is on screen is very carefully crafted. And I really love this method and the results that he gets from it. I also really like that there's no working title. He doesn't call it anything until he sees the finished whole, so that doesn't unduly influence anybody. He describes Happy Go Lucky as first and foremost a collaboration between him and Sally Hawkins. She's really at the forefront of this process. So much so that he let her in on a couple of steps of that process that he never shared with actors before. And in return, she describes that process as very intense but very fulfilling. She says that, He's always searching, which is a thing that I think he inherits from Cassavetes. I think that's a really apt parallel. He's always looking in every corner for detail. And as an outside observer, I would think that you would really have to have actors that are wired a certain way to get good results like that. That's why he and Cassavetes end up building these repertory companies. And I think we could talk about that process endlessly, but there's one quick thing I wanted to jump in with here before we move on. I thought this was so interesting especially as I've seen it go both ways in the theater. He has a rule that he doesn't allow actors to talk about their character in the first person. Instead, he wants them to be really aware that they're creating a character, and he needs them to be able to stand outside and critique their own work. It's incredibly fascinating. Now, I said that he doesn't typically make technically showy films, but he did employ a lot of techniques in this instance that you previously wouldn't have associated with Mike Lee. This is his very first widescreen effort. He chose a new and different film stock that highlights bright primary colors. Notably, it's a very much more nimble and mobile camera than we've ever seen in his filmography before. There is more focus than ever on one single character. And then there's this really cheerful score, which we hear as we watch her cycle around in the opening credits. That music, by the way, is by Gary Yershon, and he also scored Mr. Turner in Another Year with Mike Lee. This very beginning opening music as we watch her bike through the expanse of the city, it feels almost like a comedy from the 50s. There's gentle brass, 
It's not really modern, I guess is what I'm going for, but it's not dippy like a 1960s comedy would be. So were you waiting for Carry On Poppy to start? Is that what you're saying? I'm glad that it didn't, even though some of the exchanges do have a feel of the body 1970s hospital to them. But we have Poppy right away. And all I could think of at first was, how does she manage to bike in those clothes? But I think we get a sense, at least, something about her. We feel that we know her. What do you think the tone is, and do you feel like it's already set for the film? It definitely sets a specific tone, but knowing Mike Lee, I'm ready for that to change and gradually progress and maybe darken. It's the very first thing that I have here in my notes, too. People think of this... I think, as lighter than his previous work. Does it feel to you, do you think of it that way, as a light movie? Does he even make light movies? As you mentioned, the film and Poppy, all of those elements are going to deepen. But we do learn that there's no dark soul roiling inside of her. There's certainly no facade, but there is darkness. It could also just be my personal experience. I feel maybe an implied threat when we meet the character of Scott. And it could also be that sense of expectation versus reality, constantly being on tenterhooks that something bad is going to happen. Thankfully for me, you told me ahead of time, no, (laughs) nothing truly terrible is going to happen, and I'm so glad you did. Is this one of those instances where if I hadn't said that, the way we are conditioned as film goers, you would have been expecting it the whole time? I would have. And it's really wonderful that our expectations are challenged in that way and then in a number of other ways. I have that a lot in my notes, too, about how often he is subverting these specific types of comic genres. I would never say light if anyone asked me to describe this. I would definitely say light-hearted, maybe. I think there's a very specific difference. I think light implies frivolousness, and this is not that at all. It's not a complete departure in that all of his films have pain and joy. It's just more to the joyous end of the spectrum than the rest of them. I wonder if that was a disappointment to the hardcore miserablists in his fan base. I really wonder if It was a rebuke to them to give them this character, to put her in their faces the whole time and make her so inescapably lovable. He did declare that he made an anti-miserablist film. The existence of Poppy always puts me in mind immediately, too, when we're talking about music here, of one of my other favorite things, Camper Van Beethoven, in that same smart but loopy way, and specifically tied to the song Life is Grand, and this sentiment that life is grand... And I will say this at the risk of falling from favor with those of you who have appointed yourselves to expect me to say something darker. So I'm glad I could tell you before we go into it that no, none of those things that you might be worried about are going to befall this beautiful character. I think you also had to say that to me to get me to watch it because (laughs) I was so concerned about it. But you knew, having seen it before, that this was going to be the thing that would make my day. Right away, one of those expectations, I think, is blown away. She's biking to get to a bookstore. And in the way that she has, that we come to know as Poppy's way, she's going to start a conversation without necessarily a partner there to converse with. The bookstore clerk actively refuses to acknowledge or speak to her. And as I'm watching her, not knowing exactly who this character is, she at first seems kind of overwhelmed. And I'm wondering, am I to think that maybe she's just kind of dumb? Is that my expectation of someone who goes first to the children's section in the bookstore? Well, before we know she's a teacher, that's the first thing we see her do. So, yes, are we expected to think, is she kind of simple? There's a lot of Sally Hawkins in Poppy, I think, and it helps inform this character. Her parents are actually both teachers that went on to write children's books, for example. There is a lot of Hawkins' experiences that make this character real and recognizable. Even if we don't recognize what we're seeing at first, and even the things that make her a little exasperating. And so I'm thinking that, and watching her, and then I hear her parting comment, basically, don't worry, I'm going now, which signals to me that this is someone with a sense of humor, and some degree at least, of self-awareness. I don't know how many of our listeners have ever worked in retail or in the service industry anywhere. But you definitely recognize this type of customer. 
trying a little too hard to make a connection, having to comment on every little thing. Not everyone wants that. It's really a testament to Sally Hawkins that I stick with it. And she teaches me a bigger lesson about the people I encounter like that in my life. Mike Lee wanted to remind us that everyone you meet in the course of the day is the tip of their own iceberg, basically. And he very specifically constructed the opening of this film to test us and to make her more complicated as things unfold. So gradually, most of us like or even love her by the time it's over. Poppy is a real Rorschach test of a character. Your response to her says something about who you are. And I admit, I went for his manipulation completely. How about you? A 100%. And in the next bit, when she walks out to find that her bike is gone, this bike we've spent a few minutes watching her joyously pedal all through the city. And so my inclination would have been to scream and curse and freak out. And she doesn't do that. She just moves on, looking for an alternate means of transportation. So I guess every scene becomes an opportunity for me to think about what would I do, how do I view this character, and how are my expectations being subverted all over the place? Well, I make myself feel better about it by telling myself that Lee is an intelligent and gifted storyteller, but still, I'm slightly ashamed that it was too easy for me to be irritated by her initially. In my defense, I do come around. I'm not so closed off that I don't give her a chance. At what point do you feel like you started to warm up to her? Was it when her bike was stolen or did it come a little bit later than that? You know, it might have just been that big smile on her face. Even if she had ended up being a more simplistic character, I think I was still predisposed to like her because Sally Hawkins just has a beautiful open face. I think though it became really clear that I was on her side once we see her with her friends and especially the morning after the clubbing that they do, interacting with her sister, also a character I love, and then beginning to see the work that she does before she goes into the classroom. I think our answers to that question sort of dovetail. Mine was like that too. I didn't so much feel it with the bicycle and shrugging that off, but I definitely felt it a little bit when she's with her sister. And I, too, love her sister. I really like their relationship. Realistic and caring sibling dynamics are always going to be something I respond positively to. I think those good feelings became more pronounced when she's on the bus and she gets jostled. And her reaction is just proof that you cannot smile back at this woman when she smiles at you. Finally, though, I think I'm really all in with her when we first see her with students, when she's teaching. She encourages wonder, she imparts knowledge, she keeps things under control, and all in about 20 seconds of a single scene. Part of my response to that is probably grounded in my feeling that teaching is one of the most proactively optimistic things that you can do with your life. And the other part of it is just how much her intelligence shines through. It's equal to her empathy. And I get a little gentle reprimand from that, from underestimating her the first time. She's not some holy fool. And this gradual blossoming affection, I feel, is the benefit that you reap when your narrative is, I think something you were beginning to talk about, cumulative rather than causal. I usually tend to prefer the former, the character study. I'm really glad that you mentioned and used the specific phrase that she's not a holy fool. There's no magic simpleton in this story. She's a real person. And... I also like that I'm constantly having to face that I'm probably overestimating myself. I need to relax and enjoy it and take her on her face because she's all face value. As I mentioned, there's no facade here. You don't mean that as a pejorative, right? That is definitely not. Absolutely she's shallow. not. No, definitely not. So then how do we properly convey how rich of a character study this is? Because on its surface, if we just describe it, Invariably, I feel like something's lost in translation. If we just say, for example, a young teacher's bike is stolen and she takes those lemons and makes lemonade, that certainly doesn't cut it. So how to properly put across how life-affirming it is without being treacle? Gosh, I don't know. There is a lot of depth here. We go through what are essentially vignettes, but make up a whole life. Family relationships, a romantic relationship, a really difficult school situation. And the ensemble cast here is pretty large. We get to know all of those people as well through her empathy and her listening ear. 
So it's not just a character study of Poppy, it's these characters that make up her community. And then we also see that really difficult relationship she's about to encounter, that person who cannot interact with her in the way that she would allow for, in the way that she's most adept at. I think the key for me is how natural all of those performances are. Obviously, Lee's stock and trade is realism, and I put that in quotes a little bit because it hasn't exactly been that way since maybe the early 80s. It's close, but there are plenty of elements now that are idealized. You do have to distill the results of those rehearsals, and there are some critics that feel like that distillation pushes the dialogue over into cartoonish or exaggerated, almost Dickensian territory. One of the things I can't relate to is the volume of the conversation. That's not to say I think it's unrealistic. I'm sure that there are people out there like that. But I don't talk all week as much as they talk while they are standing at the stove stirring this evening's dinner. It really makes me think that I'd like to see Poppy sit down with David Thewlis's character from Naked and then see what they take away from that hours-long conversation with one another. How real are these conversations to you? How much does your assessment or acceptance of her communication say about you versus the character in the process of that creation. It's definitely a rhythm, and it's not a rhythm that I find to be natural for me. You and I don't have a constant back and forth where there's never a breath taken. I do know people like that, though. And I think, most importantly, for the character that's been created, for Poppy, for her beloved flatmate and friend Zoe, it does seem incredibly natural. It's natural for them. It's not necessarily natural for all of us. And we talked about her sister Susie. They share those same silly jokes, and that seems incredibly appropriate for their relationship. I briefly mentioned Zoe a second ago, and the next scene is, I think, easily my single favorite in the whole movie. That's Poppy and Zoe gathering supplies for what we find out is going to be their work day. I have two favorite bits, but they come much later. What is it about this that you like so much? First, I love the music in this section. It's lovely. It reminds me, actually, of an educational film from the 1970s. There's a gentle rhythm here to what they do. It's echoed in the music. There's thoughtfulness, there's dedication, there's companionship and understanding. I found it so intriguing because I wasn't exactly sure what they were going to do, and then it really paid off from the children's book that I saw her reading earlier. They're making these masks and headdresses to form the basis of this lesson that they're going to have on birds and migration. There are certain scenes in films. We had an example the other day from Two Years at Sea. This is one that I want to live inside of. I could just spend the rest of the afternoon with them, watching them work. I think this goes a little bit to what you were saying about the building of a complete universe. Everything she does however she spends her time, and all the people that she runs into all feel so fully fleshed out and real. And whether that's work or just her extracurricular activities, you get a true sense of the rhythm of her life. Her extracurricular activities are so perfectly her. We find out that she's always been a traveler. There's the trampolining, the flamenco dancing. Even a trip to the chiropractor is poppified. Even pain is a reason for laughter in an excuse to explore a new experience. By the way, my mom does that. She laughs when something hurts. I know there are a lot of people like that, but yeah, my mom has always done that. I wondered what you thought about a scene coming up here, which feels sort of like our first spoken social commentary. It's Poppy in the pub with her teacher friend Tash and also with Zoe. And they're kind of lamenting that these kids today spend all of their time on screens and no time outside. Poppy is representing, I think, kind of the equally relevant other side, which is that parents, especially single parents, and especially in the environment that she's working in, are probably exhausted. There's really no free time to have this outdoor play. And then we have that counterpoint of, if something is important enough, you will find a way. Did that feel at all shoehorned to you? Did that feel unnatural or more of a natural extension of what teachers might literally talk about? I'm not a teacher. I know a lot of them, so I can't say for sure. But anytime I spend time with them away from work, 
it doesn't tend to gravitate on that. If they're doing what these women are doing, which seems to be winding down, getting away from that, trying to not think about it, it's not the sort of thing that creeps into the conversation very often. So it feels maybe a little shoehorned. I'm with you. I've known some really intense teachers, people who prided themselves on really preparing incredible lessons. I think they're a bit in the minority. They would be pretty intense in their off time too. I think that's a good point. I think the fact that they are in the minority sort of reflects how everyone, whatever the occupation is, there's always going to be that bell curve where you have these super intense ones at one end and then a small fraction of the completely apathetic at the other. And everyone else, which is how I think of these characters, falls somewhere in between. And not to suggest that the other majority of teachers are somehow not dedicated. It's just the shop talk feels a little shop talky here. So we go from one not-so-subtle example of human beings interacting to an extremely unsubtle interaction with another human being. And that's when she meets her new driving instructor, Scott, played by Eddie Marson, for the first time. And they are just oil and water. These scenes, cumulatively, are probably most illustrative of what I was saying about optimism and grace winning the day without being overly sentimental. It's the classic screwball comedy formula turned on its head. It's two people that shouldn't be together, but are. That's life. So it's a really nice subversion of the genre. She's taking the piss the whole time, and he's either unaware or ignoring that completely. And his frustration with her is palpable. Ironically, speaking of teachers, he begins to explain teaching to her, not knowing what she does for a living, and his reaction to finding out that she is a teacher is full of so many conflicting emotions in the blink of an eye. It's disbelief, maybe a little admiration, and unexpected respect, complete and total dismay at the idea of her being in charge of someone else's education. And also characteristic of him, complete rage at the same time. I really wish I could have seen their improvisation sessions together. In his initial character work, he talks about how he thought he was preparing for a drama, a really intense drama, and that I think is what creates this explosion when they get together. This working method, especially the relative isolation in the beginning, it makes all of this feel like real life in one very concrete way for me. Everyone involved in this is coming at it from the perspective that they are the one that is central to proceedings, much the same way that it's our reflex to think of our own lives as a movie in which we are the star. So, if we're going to go back to our own expectations and our own experience, I immediately thought that he was dangerous and terrifying. What did you think? He didn't strike me that way so much, because there is a specific aspect of his character that I relate to. I understand being the angry person. For different reasons, let me just put that out there, make that yes, extremely definitely. clear. But I'll get into that more as we encounter more of them together. Sort of dovetailing into what you're talking about. He's the kind of person I expect to be constantly populating our world. He's like the world's worst subreddit come to life. And I can also, like you said, understand him from a point of view. I have been in situations where I only have an hour in which to do my job. You are my partner in that. I don't mean you, Cole. I mean the universal you, who, whomever is in the room with me. And to think that you would want to spend that hour talking or moving around or fidgeting or whatever, as opposed to what we have come here to do. In my case, it might be massage, for example. Or I might have a support call with you to try to troubleshoot an issue. I can't imagine why you just would want to fool around that whole time. Hey, why don't you lighten up? In Raha. In Raha. <laughs> so then, am I right or is she right? She is still in to do these lessons with him, even though he's shown her that he's probably fairly unstable at least. Does that mean that she is a good judge of character or just too trusting? Or can it be both? I think her motivation comes out a little bit more as these sessions continue. She has to reschedule one of them because of the chiropractic appointment, and this upsets him. It's that very thing you're talking about. We have an agreement. This is the time we have to work. He doesn't respond very well to that sort of thing. So he's off balance a little bit, which exposes his true nature a little bit more, because we start to get an inkling that he may be a little racist. 
And as he is revealed to be more and more repellent, what I began to wonder was not having to do with whether she was a good judge of character or too trusting. It was more about why does she stick with this? And it has to do with her true nature as an educator, which goes beyond the boundaries of her classroom. She believes in redemption and would never, ever write someone off unless she absolutely had to. I don't think that she thinks that she can save everyone, but she's going to always do everything she can. She's the living embodiment of that starfish parable. It makes a difference to this one. I think she's always going to be there to do what she does best, which is, if nothing else, to listen. And that's how you can help people sometimes the most, without saying, I am trying to help you. Now, his reasoning, on the other hand, for sticking with it, I think it's really all about him. He says at one point, I've never given up on a pupil. It's a perverse point of pride. It's all about what he is achieving or failing to do. Especially ironic for someone who has almost no qualities conducive to teaching another human being anything. Another thing I thought of here, not always, but often, there's a character that is the director's surrogate, very clearly. Scott would have to be the stand-in for Lee, right, if there is one, because there is no other character that even comes close to functioning that way. So much of this comes from the actors, though, in that preliminary process of exploration and improvisation that I don't even know if it's fair to think about it that way. Do you see Scott's function as saying the things that Lee wants to say? I think it's possibly a bit more of saying the things that many others of us would say, or there's the potential to say. If you belong to the National Front. Okay, I phrased that poorly. (laughs) I guess just the most negative aspects of all of us rolled into one thing. The only other director surrogate I could think of is really Zoe. I tend to think of her as quietly bringing people together. For me, I think it functions mainly as another nice bit of genre subversion. Other more facile directors would make Poppy the manic pixie dream girl, and Scott would be Lee's proxy who is saved by her somehow. But that thing you mentioned about Zoe, I think it's great. That's something I hadn't thought of, so I want to get into that a little bit. If Mike Lee's surrogate is the facilitator of the group versus Scott, one of the only significant male characters, I wonder what you think about this. How well, how accurately does Lee depict female friendships in your estimation? Is it notable for you that a male director seems to be such a keen observer of those dynamics? Obviously, it's another one of those things, like I just said, about the performers bringing that to the process before it even gets to the filming stage. So how much of it is Mike Lee as an artist and how much of it is him just getting out of the way? Until you just now said female friendship, I hadn't been thinking about it in those terms at all. I was just thinking about friendship. And I don't mean that in any sort of progressive way. I don't see gender. I just saw it as really human beings, neither of whom I necessarily specifically identify with, interacting naturally with each other. They have built this relationship over time. They each bring something different to it, and they're there in what friendship is supposed to be, which is supporting and loving each other. So I'm not even really sure what he's trying to say, or if he's trying to say anything about female friendship. I think he's brought together gifted performers, I think he's an amazing director and writer, and that is what has come naturally from it. I feel pretty similarly to you, but I think there are one or two things that make it specific to gender for me for a very certain reason. The thing I like most about them is how much Poppy and her friends stand in stark contrast to Poppy's pregnant sister. So this is a dynamic that can only exist between women. They're all living, doing all of these things they want to do the way they want, and they still wouldn't, like Helen, presume that other people could only be happy emulating them. And then I compare these women with the friend groups that you see in American films, big budget Hollywood films, thinking of huge examples the things that ticket sales would seem to indicate this is what people want and relate to. Things like Thelma and Louise, Steel Magnolias, Beaches, The First Wives Club, any of this current crop of girls' night out movies. And bear in mind, I have an exactly equal disdain for the equally dumb concept of boys' night out. You put any of those movies like that next to Happy Go Lucky and they look like melodramatic cartoons. There is nothing real at all about them in comparison. 
I have to really cast around to find something that I think is relatable. And while it's American, it's not necessarily a Hollywood film. It's Ghost World. That, I think, is maybe the best American movie about female friendship of the last 20 years. I disagree. Okay. In what way? What are you thinking? I don't see any friend part in the relationship between those two women, Hmm. the Scarlett Johansson and Thora Birch characters. Maybe it's because it seems like Thora Birch's character cannot convey any sort of sense of naturalness or warmth. I can't imagine her rooting for anything, and it seems like at the end of the day, that relationship, especially for Scarlett Johansson, is born so much out of passivity. So this crucial support element that you're talking about, it's just not there. It has been a while since I saw it. I would say at least, gosh, 20 years at this point? Is that right? Yeah, that's about right. Maybe the word I'm looking for is dynamic instead of friendship. The most accurate representation of that dynamic. Because I don't think you feel that it's inaccurate in what it portrays, right? Yeah, I think it's two young women who, based on proximity and just being misfits in general, were together. And that's how a relationship was born. But it's not one that's built to last. And I really like that change to dynamic. I do think that that is a good one. Well, regardless of how much I botched that argument, I think what actually separates Mike Lee's work again stems from the working method that you were talking about and how he approaches people. Every character is important because every human being is valid. Gender, age, etc. has nothing to do with it. The female characters are afforded the exact same agency and validity as the male characters, and maybe it just feels remarkable because it's still relatively uncommon and the bar has been so low for so long. It's a telling thing about the human condition, I guess. Egalitarianism is still and may always be a revolutionary idea, and now I'm just starting to get annoyed thinking about the laziness of conventional filmmaking. I just wish that we saw real people more often, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'm not sure I constantly want to see real people, unless they're more like Poppy. (laughs) Because going back again to that Ghost World example, I remember watching that with my best friend, Darcy, and feeling almost befuddled by why anyone would want to spend time with either of these people. And yet, we already established that is a real dynamic. Those people feel real and lived in. So you would rather it would just be Bridesmaids and New Ghostbusters 24-7? Not quite, though, gosh, that does sound kind of I like actually, fun. now that I say it, hanging out with Kristen Wiig and Kate McKinnon 24-7 does not sound like a bad time. Because my other example, I know you don't want to hear this because I've already been talking about it over the last couple of days, is The Spy Who Dumped Me. I think that is a great example of friendship. I think you're probably exactly right about that in the things that you see in it, but It gets away from the thing that I'm seeing here, which is the thing that he mentioned that I talked about in the beginning, people sitting in a room. When I think of kitchen sink realism, I don't think of an exaggerated comic situation like you see in The Spy Who Dumped Me. But then I turn around and we have this flamenco class. I'm just going to do it for our next mini episode. Then you're going to have to watch it with me. The Spy Who Dumped Me? Yeah. I'll watch it with you. I like Kate McKinnon a lot. Absolutely. She's wonderful. Anyway, yes. Flamenco class. It's a new extracurricular activity. It's interesting here because she and her principal go to this class. They're late. And there's also that business of her needing to take off her sunglasses. She's interrupting the teacher and the flow of the class. She has to be shushed. And she looks kind of abashed here, which I do really appreciate. But she gets over it quickly, like with all things, as she tries to embody an eagle spreading its wings. There is so much here in these scenes about teaching, about giving and receiving instruction. This instructor is suffering. She cannot leave her personal baggage at the door. Poppy, of course, is the only one in the group that asks after her. It just makes me think, can you be an effective teacher even if you are not in a good place yourself? Because Scott obviously can't, but there has to be a spectrum, right, that all of these behaviors fall on? Can you channel that into educating someone if the subject matter, for example, is something that works in a more emotionally charged state like flamenco? I've been an instructor before, and it can be so incredibly rewarding. And I do remember those times when difficult things are happening outside the classroom. 
I think that's when I would always just make everybody face the wall or do lots of <laughs> downward dog or we're going to stretch or you know what today's the day let's all envision Sweeney Todd and act it out somehow. Well the other side of that coin that I think about here is Poppy's progress as a student at flamenco at driving. Can teachers be good learners? Because after having dealt with an awful lot of them in my capacity running the bookstore, I'm a little skeptical. I feel like a lot of the teachers that I encountered, and here we are on that bell curve, they were through with learning. Some of them emphatically so. And I have a theory as to why this happens. Keys. Are we talking about Keynes, the economist, or keys that we use in our cars? No, <laughs> one of those things. Teacher's Keys, the book that has all the right answers in it. I think those are inherently detrimental to maintaining an inquisitive nature. For years, they're the only one in the room that has the book that has all the answers that can't be questioned. You do that long enough, and it has to have some sort of residual effect on you, the same way cops begin to see everyone as a criminal. Here's where I feel like I align a bit with Poppy, and you can agree or disagree. I think that she's not necessarily into mastery of something, which I think makes you a good learner. Well, it does and it doesn't, because I'm very much more at that end of the spectrum. I'm very much more about, if I cannot perfect this, then I don't even want to try. And it takes an awful lot of the fun out of stuff sometimes. So knowing what I know about how that stuff makes me feel sometimes... I don't necessarily think that being someone who just wants to have the experience rather than master it is necessarily a bad thing or makes you less of a student. I was saying that this is what I see of myself in her. I'm not looking necessarily to perfect something. I'm not looking for a terminus point, as in, once I get here, I will be great at this. And I think it makes people like us a little bit more open to those things. We're not necessarily afraid of failure because failure really isn't built into it. So she doesn't need to have some sort of outward proof that she has gotten this thing down. So in that regard, being a good learner, the central aspect of what you're talking about is just being open to the experience at all. Is that what is crucial to it? I think so. I think at least that's a big part of it. Before we move on, I do want to talk a second about this scene after the flamenco dance and also scenes that we've seen with Zoe. I think it's a really interesting device. It didn't occur to me the first time I watched it, but it really struck me the second time. We watch an action play out, and then we have Poppy discussing what took place with whomever is there. That could be Heather the principal or Zoe her friend. I really like that aspect of this film. I like that aspect of sitting in a room talking about things, even though we as the viewer have already maybe made our own decisions about them. It's watching Poppy process these things and share her life with those around her. Well, one of these conversations that we observe the beginning of that's a little more serious, a little more grave, happens when Poppy is observing a troubled student who's acting out, who's being a bully, and then she goes to her principal to discuss what we can do about this. And so we watch this whole story unfold. She sees the kid bullying someone. It escalates to necessitating this really illuminating meeting with a social worker and the kid. And that's juxtaposed with another driving lesson, clearly tying that child's dysfunction to Scott's dysfunction. Is this another instance of two on the nose, maybe? If it is, boy, does it feel realistic. And all I can think is that he didn't have a poppy in his life when he needed her. And unfortunately, a lot of us are in that boat. We truly see that his bullying is a direct result of being bullied, and it's evolved into this monstrous chip on his shoulder. Yeah, there's just so much in these times that they meet for these driving lessons. We could spend the whole hour just delving into his pyramid metaphor, and how that applies to his assessment of her and the educational system and the way all of that has affected his life. Specifically, the most significant thing being what you just said, having never known a poppy before. There has to be a part of the audience that also relates strongly to Scott, as much as everyone wants to be poppy or love poppy or knows someone who is in poppy's orbit. This demographic for whom expecting the worst in everyday driving circumstances is an apt metaphor for their entire philosophy. He's a profoundly unhappy and angry man. And I said I can definitely relate to that, just not 
about the multiculturalism or conspiracy theories, Occam's razor means that I don't have to look that far for something to be upset about. I don't even have to look outside of myself. And because of that, I think what I can't relate to in him is his inability to accept responsibility for his situation. He blames his unhappiness on a lot of external circumstances. I tend to blame myself, so I can only really sympathize with him in some ways, not fully empathize. I do think that it's interesting that we can find something to listen to. I don't know that he's necessarily entirely wrong all the time either in what he says to her, how he characterizes her. She does celebrate chaos. She is too easily distracted sometimes, but she's not smug ever. So we can't necessarily just completely discount him. She doesn't. And we talked about that juxtaposition with her student, Nick, when she says that she is there to be a mate, she's there to help, I completely believe her. So I guess what I'm saying, I think everyone manages to find the right, correct note. Speaking of, I did want to point out one last thing. I think the makeup on his teeth is an incredible choice. It's a really smart and rich detail. Because I can extrapolate so much from that one little thing. All this vitriol that he spews comes from this observably rotten spot. It could easily be something that he was bullied about as a younger person, strengthening that link between he and Nick. And I think most importantly, it could be a literal impediment between him and the healing touch of another person. An impediment to intimacy because it's not an attribute that inspires physical closeness. There's a lot of chicken or the egg in terms of his rancor and bitterness built into this one small detail. I think this next section is really interesting because she meets another person who does also have a lot of barriers up, but she's able to connect in an interesting way. Before we meet that person, there's a beautiful sequence here. She's in this amazing park, and I'm wondering, maybe she is too, what her place is in this undulating world. I find that scene remarkable too, but I think in a different way than it works for you. It occurs after one of these meetings with the child, Nick, who's having so much trouble at home. And what struck me was how it feels like it's the first greenery that we've seen. It's shocking almost how calming and restorative it feels after that turmoil. Now at this point, it's late night and she's in less of an inhabited area, kind of more of an industrial park. And here's a sort of chanting. Now, this scene, this section might be kind of polarizing, and I wonder what your thoughts are. How does this work within the larger act that we're in? So what you're talking about is this scene where she encounters this homeless man who is probably also at least slightly mentally ill, who is suffering in some way. For me, I think it works fine. It does not bother me at all. I can easily see her wanderings just taking her places that she doesn't expect to end up in. And I think it's a great example of how her empathy is boundless. Even at risk to herself and her safety, she gets through to people. I think though my favorite part of this, one of my favorite parts of the movie that I was talking about earlier, it actually occurs in the aftermath of this meeting. I really love that she will not specifically tell Zoe about it. If you've been paying attention, you know that after 10 years as roommates and best friends, she tells Zoe practically everything, including the most private and important things in her life, and yet she still keeps this as a private exchange between her and this man. It seems like it's more about respecting and protecting him in whatever small capacity she can. If all she can do is keep his confidence, then that is what she's going to do. I responded to it because... He doesn't necessarily need her. And they manage to connect on this deeper level. And I think it's interesting because it's less about voices and language, which is all poppy, and more about eyes and minds. I'm also interested because this is the second man that she's encountered who literally could kill her. And it makes me wonder, me specifically, Erica, the viewer, is she ignoring this possibility, or is this my cynicism? So you're saying you cannot see yourself at all ending up in a place like this, motivated by the things that she is. Is that what you mean? I think those specific circumstances would conspire to make me just more afraid than anything. Well, it's not unreasonable, and I don't think that that's something that Mike Lee is not trying to do. 
it sets her apart. It shows us what makes her special and different from the rest of us. Now, in another one of these reflective moments with Zoe, and in other ways, I think, but especially this conversation they're having, we see that Poppy does feel the lack of a partner, a romantic partner. And I wanted to get your reaction to that specifically when it comes to accuracy and Mike Lee's sense of realism. What you see play across her face, does all of this feel true how much of a component of your fulfillment is that? Do you recognize that in what she's feeling? I didn't register that moment in the same way, so it's not something that I thought about. Maybe that's because up to now, she's deflected any suggestion that not having a partner is somehow a terrible thing or that she's excessively lonely. That's one of the things I like about her, the way she treats that. Even if it's important to her, she would not be prescriptive about it for anyone else. And so I guess, strictly speaking, to answer your question, it does seem quite real, and I can relate to it. Sometimes you might be sad about it, sometimes you might not think about it. And at the same time, how wonderful it is to have these loving relationships. And to think that a romantic relationship might also be coming your way at some point is still a wonderful thing too. Well, spoiler alert, it is on the horizon for her. Before we get there, I just want to take a second to talk about this upcoming scene with Nick. When we do meet Tim, the social worker, this to me is the social commentary that's made with a very light hand. When that pub scene earlier might feel a bit heavy-handed, this is the opposite to me. Maybe it's because it's the child saying things that seem like they would come out of a young child. I think that has a lot to do with it. It's really beautiful, and it's also pretty devastating to watch this child's chin dip lower and his face get pinker. I think what I love the most here, though, is that before they get into the really hard stuff with Nick, they take time to celebrate him. Because not everything is terrible all the time. And it gives me a sense that, as they kind of say to each other later, he's going to be okay. At least if we say it with our fingers crossed, we can still possibly believe it. So this really difficult meeting has spawned something quite beautiful and genuinely uplifting. And that's her scene of flirtation with Tim. She's walking out with him and they indicate that they want to see each other again. This I like. This also feels real. And if we want to compare it to Hollywood movies, something that actually feels romantic, as does their date, which we'll get to in a bit. It kind of plays to you a little bit like I feel about Gregory's Girl, that kind of feeling like this is an actual thing that would actually happen somewhere far away from a John Hughes movie. A romance that genuinely feels romantic. Well, that thing I was saying about why I like her approach to this, that not being prescriptive to others, that's a character that's especially important in relation to this scene that we have coming up where she makes a visit with her friends to her sister, Helen. Helen is a selfish crud who cannot see any path other than her own. She's so paranoid and insecure, and I'm guessing the youngest of all. Where do you put her in their family dynamic with Poppy and Susie? I put Susie as the youngest. I think Helen is the middle. But this bullshit of when are you going to grow up? Like a mortgage or creating another mouth for this world to feed is somehow more valid than teaching, inspiring, and caring for the people that are already here. If you want to make me hate a character, there's your play. The old, everyone wants the white picket fence and 2.3 children card. It doesn't get any easier than that to make me despise a character. Her husband, on the other hand, seems all right. <laughs> you just need to get on the property ladder. <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> this scene, this exchange, is the only point that felt, I guess, forced to me and kind of unnatural, even though I think maybe Helen is the surrogate for the worst part of the audience, probably. It just felt too easy. It did kind of feel like that Mike Lee moment where we say secrets and lies out loud. Maybe Helen is speaking her subtext because Helen's just a big dummo. She is a crud. You're 100% correct on that one. Well, after they get back from this weekend jaunt, it turns out Scott is waiting for them outside their flat. And it's scary. It's creepy. She has clearly affected him. And in spite of himself, he is drawn to her light. Even as stalkery and dangerous as this feels, does this also mean that there's hope for him? 
because it implies, at least a little bit, that he wants to be happy. He just doesn't know how. If by wants to be happy means make a suit out of her skin, <laughs> I think I think that's a little too optimistic. But again, maybe that's my own experience in cynicism. Well, do you think she's picking up on this to the degree that it's that grave? Because the title, if you go by the dictionary, at least implies a little obliviousness. Do you think she is fully aware of the effect that she has on people? I don't know exactly how to answer that. I don't think that she's completely oblivious, and clearly she's rattled here. He's been showing those signs of his growing sexual fixation with her, a really unhealthy version of it. And I don't know how you could then see all of that, see what he's done, and then get in the car with him again. In this regard, at least, I think the title is a little deceptive. I think she's fully aware. She's clearly been demonstrated to be perceptive and empathic and intelligent. And that extends to herself, which is not necessarily a given, even with those qualities. She's not blind to the realities of life. It's not mindless, her approach. It's quite healthy, I feel like. I think she assigns things their proper weight. She doesn't ignore things, thankfully. I couldn't care as much about her if she operated that way. But she also doesn't give them the space that they don't deserve. All of which is an incredibly mature and often difficult thing to do. You compare how she reacts to having her bike stolen, for instance, versus understanding the gravity of Nick's home life. You can't just write her off as empty-headed or having one relentlessly happy setting. Is she a glass half full person? Definitely. Probably more than that. Seven-eighths full, let's say. But not to the point of self-delusion. Before we get back to having some fun, <laughs> I guess she's not thinking about the reality of sexual assault statistics. I don't know if that's to her favor, but it certainly doesn't make me feel great having that information living in my head all the time. Well, how about we talk about a much more positive, healthy expression of those feelings? Let's talk about her date with Tim. Again, a romantic evening that actually feels romantic. They're sitting on the same side of the booth, and most importantly, he's on her same wavelength. That conversational joke rhythm that she has. And back in his flat, it is super sexy when she says, oh wow, it seems incredibly appropriate. I think the moment that I like the most in that scene is actually the one you chose for our opening scene. That moment when she asks, are you happy? And then tags on, in your life, that song lyric. It may feel like a throwaway, but I think it's a really brilliant, multifaceted detail. It allows her to ask the most important thing to her in terms of determining, is this the person for me? It's truly central to her being. But she's able to make this big question less intimidating at the same time. And I think the semantic distinction between in your life versus, say, something like about your life is important and very intentional while still feeling spontaneous. I'm also going to give a recommendation here that I've done many times before, and that is to watch the film with the sound off. I did that when I was trying to locate the scene so I could make sure I transcribed it properly. When they're still in the pub before they go back to his place, watching her face, it is remarkable. And when they both say, this is nice, that is possibly the single most believable line. Minus the obvious extreme examples, do you think that everyone deserves to be happy? Or is that even the right question? Should we be thinking of it more broadly with contentedness as the center of everything and then happiness as a symptom of that? I'm going to try to channel Poppy here a little bit. I think, yes, everyone deserves to be happy. I think most importantly, everyone deserves to be listened to. We're going to take a big right turn here. And I think the music gives us a little bit of a sense of what's going to come. It starts out with those same flutes and strings that we've been hearing, and it gets a bit more ominous. And that's Tim dropping Poppy off for her lesson with Scott. Scott's there waiting. He refuses to shake Tim's hand. And I think at this point, even though you had told me everything was going to be okay, I still had that fear that Poppy would eventually get hurt somehow. And I think I held my breath through this last section. It's a perfectly reasonable feeling to have. She does go through a trauma here. 
I think maybe one that's more significant than even is obvious at first blush, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. But that thing you just said makes me wonder, do you feel like, Scott, do you feel like this character, that's what he is suffering from the most, that no one is listening? I think no one's ever listened, and I think he's one of those people, every word out of his mouth when he was younger was met with shut up. So there was never an opportunity to express himself or to see people expressing themselves in any kind of a positive way. And he also seems like a person for whom having any kind of human touch, you touched on this earlier, would probably be pretty alien. Could he even remember the last time he was touched with affection? I would venture to say it's probably hard for him to remember it if it ever occurred at all. Well, we arrive at this last driving lesson, and it starts with the confrontation about him being there outside her flat on Sunday, something which he will not acknowledge, something he completely denies, and he is extremely agitated, and significantly, for the first time, we are beginning to see that she has limits, too. When he finally loses it, and all of his pent-up feelings about her start to spew out, here's the one thing that sticks with me. He's shouting at her about how the world has to revolve around you. You have to be adored. You referred to this a little bit already, and in this diatribe, he is completely wrong about everything else, but is he wrong about that? How much of that is correct? I think he's saying what is true for him. I think he wants to be adored above all things. I think he wants the world to revolve around him, and it just certainly does not. So when he says, before you came along, basically, I was happy. I don't know exactly what to make of that. He was happy in the made-up world that he was living in, where it did revolve completely around him, where he adored himself and probably hated himself at the same time. Yeah, him saying that he was happy before she came along demonstrates an alarming lack of self-awareness to me. Now, in response to all of this, she does apologize at least a little. And considering how carefully this thing is crafted, what do you feel like that's about? Does she truly feel sorry about something? Or is it just a technique to de-escalate this situation? Because she does not strike me as the type to say something she doesn't mean, especially in a situation this critical. I agree. I don't think it's a de-escalation. I think she is expressing herself in the best way that she can based on what he can hear. Because she tells him he needs help, and that seems to come from the most honest place inside of her. She knows it. He can't possibly know it. But I look at that move where she has refused to give the car keys to him. And she's already de-escalated a little bit by saying that she will call the police. That seems to somehow strike a chord inside of him. He seems to listen at that point. And when she says, I wish I could make you happy, I don't read that as... Me, personally, I wish I could do something to make you happy. It seems more like, I wish I could somehow do something where you could find some happiness. Where the happiness wasn't rooted in her, but instead in him, you mean? Right. Not that I'm going to become your girlfriend, and we're going to live this life and everything's going to be great. Just something else. But that is, I think, the simplest way to explain it. That thing you just said, I think, is interesting about how much these characters are going on, what they don't know in this scene. He presses her about the new guy, whether or not that's her boyfriend, for example. She can't honestly say at this point because she doesn't know. It's not there yet. But her non-response reads to him a completely different way because in addition to not being sure herself, she does not owe him any sort of explanation at all. I think you refer to this slightly... A bit ago, I wonder, do you find him relatable at all at any point? Because, at least in the broadest sense, his arc with her mirrors ours, or most of the viewers at least, if extremely amplified. He started as irritated with her, but has gradually become enamored of her, something that we've all gone through. But is his perception of that just filtered through so many horrible things that we can't find anything in common with this guy? I think he's definitely relatable. I think of it as what we see in others, a reflection of ourselves, or especially here, who we think that they are and what we think they feel for us. And at every moment in this film, somebody, at least in these more difficult dynamic scenes, 
Somebody says at least something that's 75% true. There's enough to hang on where you think, okay, there's something there. I've got to think about this. And then that other thing to challenge us to think, is this right? Is this wrong? What do I think? I do want to mention before we completely get away from this finale, this is the other sequence that is the most affecting part of the film for me. Specifically that moment in this scene where she has to say, that's it. You can see in her face that it physically hurts her to say, no more, I have to give up on you. It is a perfect piece of acting. I think the best part of that is that it's a no without saying no, but we know that it's final. So she terminates things. She severs that relationship decisively, finally. And as hard as all of this is, I really like the denouement of this movie. It leaves me with such a satisfying feeling after experiencing this turmoil. After this extremely traumatic event, and it is significant, that thing I was referring to earlier, because to me, it's the first time she has truly suffered what she would consider a defeat, not what the rest of the world would. She still knows she'll be all right, and she still knows she has a lot of room to care for other people. There's no harm in trying to make everyone happy. Some of us do make our own luck in life. I love that it's just not her by herself. It's not she and Tim. It's she and Zoe. She's replaying again those scenes. She's sharing that life and talking about her thesis. And I think it's less about the world trying to grind her down and more about her trying to bring the world up. Now, by its very nature, that eternally optimistic, upbeat cheerfulness, it won't work for everyone. There was one critic, though, Victoria Alexander, that wrote, I kept wishing Miss Happy-Go-Lucky would get cancer. What? in the fuck is so wrong in your life that you have to write something like this. You can certainly lodge legitimate criticisms of this movie, but come on, you have some reflecting to do if two hours of a study in clear-eyed vitality makes you feel this way. I had first question, is she saying that from the standpoint of, let's show what a real curveball looks like. How would she, how would her optimism be phased or not in the face of a really big trauma like that. But that doesn't seem to be the case. No, I've gone back and read a number of her reviews, and she's still a critic. She belongs to the Las Vegas Film Critics Association, I think it is. And she seems to pride herself on being edgy and controversial and saying things like this that basically are just trolling the audience. Based on what I read of her other reviews of films, I don't even think she believes anything that she writes. Maybe she does. Maybe she's just a horrible twisted person. But basically what I'm saying is if you badmouth Sally Hawkins, I will fight you. Boy, I'm right there with you. I explored some other criticisms of the film. I wanted to get your opinion as well. Some people felt like, for example, the scene, the final scene with Poppy and Scott, that it sort of closes everything off a little too neatly and that Poppy seems unaffected by it. I completely disagree with that. I think we see it reflected in her. She's just not a weeping, defeated individual. I disagree with that read on it, too. I feel like that walk that we see her taking, she is mulling over what I said, that this is the first time we see her face genuine defeat. The person that she cannot help, at least at this point. But I think her quick rebound from it is exactly rooted in the way she looks at everything. She is not the most important thing. She might be more prone to feel crushed if she was constantly putting herself at the center of everything so she would sit around feeling sorry for herself. But when you put other people's needs in front of your own, I don't necessarily think that it takes as much time to recover from something like that. Now, we both come down on the side of Poppy, and I definitely am drawn more and more to her let's just fix it attitude. This is the one that I aspire to. Now, having said that, do you think that we or any audience member should feel guilty if they don't necessarily want to hang out with somebody like Poppy? Not necessarily, no. I freely recognize that she is not for everyone. And based on these critical reviews that I've read, clearly there is a strata of society out there that responds so negatively to this that it would be detrimental for both parties to try. So don't force that thing unnecessarily. But I think for everyone, going back to the bell curve that sits somewhere in between the two extremes of 
Poppy herself and this horrible critic, there's at least something valuable to be gleaned from getting over your preconceived notions and giving your time to someone like this. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is what you aspire to or this is ever what you're going to become, and you don't have to. I think what's important about this character is that she is so rare. But guilty? No, I don't think anybody should feel that way. You just don't have a connection. Some people just don't click. So having said that, do you find Poppy to be a believable human being or, like some people feel, more of an idealized sketch of a free spirit? I feel like she's completely believable as a human being because I've known one in my lifetime. So I can completely vouch for their existence. They are rare and valuable, but they are out there. And I think we're the better for it for having them. Will we be the better for hearing your recommendation? What do you have for us? I hope so, and I can't remember if you've seen this or not, so let me know. I chose About a Boy from 2002. I have not seen it. I'll get into why I picked it in just a second. It was directed by Chris and Paul Weitz, and they also co-adapted it with Peter Hedges from Nick Hornby's book, which I also read. It stars Hugh Grant, Tony Collette, Rachel Weiss, and Nicholas Holt. It's about an older, immature, rich man who, through a series of lies, develops a relationship with a young boy. Wait, wait, wait. I thought you said it's about a boy. It is. So that synopsis is odd on a lot of fronts, but that's the best way I could condense it down. Also, it's a comedy. And it's also dramatic. The only Hornby adaptation I've seen is High Fidelity, which I enjoy quite a bit. I picked this... Because I think of it coming out in roughly the same span of time, even though that's not really accurate, but it's the early 2000s. It's also based in London. Specifically, though, I thought about something that you and I had talked about after re-watching this film, and those people for whom, generally on the face of it, you wouldn't necessarily have an affinity for, or want to be friends with. And that goes for any of the characters in this film at many different points. But it ends up with me warming up to them, not them who change. And also in the character of young Marcus, the boy, the titular boy, I see that same let's fix it mentality that I see in Poppy. And this is all through the manipulations of Will, the suicide attempt of his mother Fiona, his own attempts to just make it through school. This movie totally caught me off guard, and I really adore it. I really hope you come to it at some point. I have to admit, Hugh Grant is a huge stumbling block on this one for me. But maybe I take a lesson from Poppy, what I learned from getting to know her, and I'll get over that. You're going to love Marcus. You're just going to love him, and he's going to get you through it. Okay, I trust you. I'll take your word for it. For my recommendation, I was thinking about a couple of things. The theme of growth and education, for one. And this thing that Muhammad Ali once said, the man who views the world at 50, the same as when he was 20, has wasted 30 years of his life. All that combined to lead me to bleak moments from 1971. It's Mike Lee's first feature film, and it stars Anne Raitt, Sarah Stevenson, Eric Allen, Julia Kappelman, and Mike Bradwell. It's about a secretary and her struggle through life with her intellectually disabled sister, aloof boyfriend, bizarre neighbor, and irritating workmate. It's really interesting to look at these two films together. You can definitely chart an evolution, both technically and in the range of emotion that his films express. He's a little like Ozu in that he's never strayed from his core themes, but each iteration manages to show us something new and a little unexpected. And even between these two films in particular, they're the same yet different. There's a smart, funny woman at the center, one of the main characters is a teacher. There are two men in her life, and one of them is racked with self-doubt and self-loathing. Their respective titles obviously telegraph the endings a little bit. His debut is a decidedly less optimistic affair with no poppy at the center. But one doesn't necessarily negate the other. I'm not saying you have to have that all the time. They're both equally valid characterizations because they're both real. Basically, if Mike Lee ran a fruit stand, here are your apples and oranges. Take a look at each one and consider the journey that Mike Lee has taken over the last almost half a century. So once again, that's two great recommendations about a boy in bleak moments. And that brings us to the end of episode 95. 
If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog, ever growing, of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast. And I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Mike Scharf, Terry and Liz at Happily Cinemaried, The Front Porch Swingers, The High and Low Podcast, Jeff Duncanson, Brian Sauer, Matteo Boscarol, Fred Osuna, Danzel Escobar, the fine gentleman at Fuds on Film, Keith Rich, our friend Laura Cannon over at the Fatal Femmes podcast, Andy Wolverton, Ross McLeod, Tim Lego, RJ Tugas, Michael Cannon, Christopher Owen, and Matt Gasteyer. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure and tag us so we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us there. Thank you to the very nice person that left us an anonymous five-star rating on iTunes. We appreciate that. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that as well. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material at the website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. And in Raha. Uh-huh.